A reproduction authenticated by the object itself is one of physical precision. It refers to the bodily real, which of necessity escapes all symbolic grids. Media always already provide the appearances of specters. Back to that boy. Alan Wake is a video game about a novel, structured like a television show, edited like a film, featuring popular songs, talk radio, and advertisements. Welcome back to the show, folks. It's safe to say the game is obsessed with the interaction between media, but what's more, it is driven by a pervasive anxiety around the question of mediatization, how we choose to represent stories and the world through various media forms. Both the game and its titular character, a pulp novelist trying his hand at more serious literature, are stretched thin across the new media landscape. The game, because it incorporates so many disparate storytelling methods into one cohesive narrative, and Alan Wake himself, as his creative mind flirts with madness in the effort to rein in his own monstrous and destructive art. A polyphonic text, the game speaks to us in multiple registers, at once captivating in its immersive quality and brazen in the flaunting of its heavily mediated presentation. Its world appears all the more authentic because it is so full of that modern indicator of liveliness, ubiquitous electric media technology. One of the first actions we perform in the game is to unjam an ancient jukebox with a good charm lap. Here the game is pointing out that when media get jammed, their physicality becomes apparent. The medium has a body as much as it would like to hide it under a ghostly veneer. This video is my own attempt at jump-starting Alan Wake, a game I've returned to and reflected on many times since its release over a decade ago. Not just a game about a horror story, Alan Wake foregrounds the spectral character of the digital bricolage that we call new media. Alan, wake up! <gasps> First, a brief overview of the narrative for those who haven't played. Alan Wake and his wife Alice have come to the quaint town of Bright Falls to heal their fraught marriage and let Alan clear his writer's block in preparation for his next novel, Departure. After a heated argument, Alan awakens with amnesia to find that Alice has been kidnapped and townspeople have gone mad under the influence of something called the Dark Presence. Alan also discovers scattered pages of his manuscript for Departure which describe events and situations that the player will soon encounter. But I was finally out of the woods and things were looking up. That's when I heard the chainsaw. And so, armed with a flashlight, a revolver, and the literal foreshadowing of his own life, Alan sets out to combat the dark presence and write an end to the horror story that he has birthed. The gameplay is informed by the dynamics of light and dark. The player must use light to pierce the shield of darkness around the Taken, as they are called, before they are susceptible to cruder implements like metal and gunpowder. But what we're really here to discuss is how Alan Wake remediates other media forms in order to confront the player with a kind of artistic authenticity. Remediation is a word with two distinct etymological roots. The first is in the sense of a remedy, a cure, balm, or medicine. Remedy also happens to be the name of the game's developer. The second sense is that of media which incorporate older media forms to establish a continuity between themselves and the more established known quantities. In their book, Remediation, Understanding New Media, scholars Jay Bolter and Richard Grusin argue that all new media are remediations. Photography, when it arrived on the scene, claimed to remediate painting. It offered effortless beauty instantaneously, the work produced by photochemical reaction, instead of the subjective human eye. And film remediated both photography and theater. Many of the earliest films were simply recordings of theatrical performances called photoplays. A medium is that which strives to bridge the gap between observer and representation. In other words, a medium produces a reality effect all media are characterized by how they impart a sense of the real. This does not necessarily mean, for example, photorealistic graphics in a video game. New media are not striving for the real in any metaphysical sense. Instead, the real is defined in terms of the viewer's experience, 
it is that which would evoke an immediate and therefore authentic emotional response. This is why a photo of a mountain, a Jackson Pollock painting, and a game with lip sync that was already dated in 2010 I told you you were too hard on her can affect us equally deeply. They all index the real in unique and powerful ways. Many games use a strategy of immediacy to make their claim on the real. Immediacy involves an attempt to obfuscate the bounds of the medium itself, to scrub away the artifice and leave the player firmly situated inside the experience. Think of the holographic HUD in Dead Space. It was touted as being more immersive because of its diegetic reality. That is, it exists physically in the world of the game. Dead Space rejects its own mediatization in favor of a pure experience, as typical gameplay elements are reframed as intrusive and even unserious. Bolter and Grusin argue that as media forms mature, they gradually change from rhetorics of immediacy to those of hypermediacy, which authenticates the work by virtue of its inclusion of older media. In essence, while works of immediacy try to deny their own mediation, works of hypermediacy recognize that the medium is always dogging at the heels of authentic expression and rather than shooing it away, it is best to delight in its acknowledgement. And delight is precisely what Alan Wake accomplishes. The town of Bright Falls has a sense of history of being lived in, thanks in large part to the way media is deployed within the game world. It's a strange but simple joy to find a radio crackling with the late night musings of the local disc jockey, or read about the invented history of a fictional town, centuries of lore preserved in the ancient medium of tree rings. Alan Wake even utilizes product placement to enlarge its world. Instead of inventing brands, the player encounters products that exist in reality. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? This is the novelty of a hypermediated approach. Artifice is recuperated in the service of authentication. No matter what you're into, Verizon Wireless can satisfy your never-ending appetite for apps. Check out Vcast apps and load up your phone. Is there something here beyond the mundane pleasure of seeing an everyday object included in a digital simulacrum? I'm not sure, but I am sure that there doesn't have to be. In any representation, every inclusion is deliberate. Deliberate in a way that the clutter and miscellanea of our own lives could never be, because ours is incidental. A writer is a light that reveals the world of his story from darkness, shapes it from nothingness, the way a sculptor carves a statue from a block of granite. If I stop, the world I'm making dies. All art is a series of choices, and every choice a revelation from blankness. Alan compares writing to sculpture, an odd simile at first, since a sculptor hews his art out of a larger whole. But if we think with this comparison, it tells us that writing is the same. The ideas are waiting, ever latent, for their realization. They swirl in darkness and must be plucked onto the page, just as the marble is cracked open to reveal the figure that was always within. But it is not the hammer and chisel that Alan Wake is concerned with. The game's narrative is instead captivated by the interplay between two media technologies of modernity, the television and the typewriter. The German media historian Friedrich Kittler catalogues how, with the advent of the personal typewriter, a metaphysical relation between author and work was thought to have been severed. No longer were the words on the page flowing directly from the author's hand. Now alienation inhered in every keystroke. Of course, in our digital mediascape such an aversion seems quaint, if not even inverted. Alan's choice, which is really a compulsion, to use a typewriter signifies a serious literary attitude. It is an overture to the immediacy of the past. The typewriter and the word processor may both deprivilege the status of the hand in the writing act, but at least the typewriter still leaves a real mark on its medium. The ink can still smudge, the words require time to set. There is a great deal of care implied in one's use of such a venerable machine. The word processor is so efficient, so clean, that, like the typewriter in its day, it imposes its own use. Even if we do not actually operate this machine, it demands that we regard it 
if only to renounce and avoid it. Renunciation is another facet of remediation. The media Alan rejects are just as important as those he embraces. As with sculpture or painting, the negative space commands our attention. But it is in the static haze of the television screen that Alan must confront the madness of unbound creativity. Alan's first writing gig was for the pulpy, twist-focused TV show Night Springs, which the player can find playing on televisions throughout the game. But Alan encounters a more literal specter from the past on television when he sees recordings of himself from inside the dark place, the swirling amnesiac artist prison where he composed the manuscript for departure. This harried Alan rants about staying true to the story. He speaks of it as a living entity, hushing himself and glancing around nervously, as though worried the narrative will overhear and countermand his script. My editor is real. I saw her again. She's not human. There's a hole in her chest where her heart should be. Which, of course, is exactly what takes place. The arc of the main game is Alan's struggle to retake control of the narrative that has been wrested away from him. To accomplish this, he must resubmerge himself in the dark place, this time steeled against its horrors and temptations. But the brilliant DLC coda to the game finds Alan trapped in the dark place, forced to confront the most malevolent parts of his psyche at the height of their potency. Here, the televisions depict Alan's torment as it is happening, live and on air, as it were. In Alan Wake, television sets radiate liveness. They spark and crackle and wriggle with manic energy. Why had everyone Everything that appears on the television screen has been filmed in live action, a stark break with the game's graphical engine. Consequently, we are arrested by these hyper-mediated images. We wonder what Alan makes of confronting a version of himself who appears more real than his own reality. Because every encounter with the television is a wrestling with the self. But some crimes are impossible to punish, especially in Night Springs. Tonight's episode, The Man in the Mirror. For Alan, the Night Springs reruns reveal the undignified past self from which he has fled, headlong, into unsustainable celebrity. The trapped Alan, in whose nightmarish narrative the player resides, appears on television as a recording, another unique affordance of the medium. He is a televisual reservoir of memory, revealing over the course of the game how Alan began to accept the responsibility of penning a tale authentic to the rules of the genre in which he resides. I've written myself into the story. I'm now the protagonist. The story must stay true for this to work. There have to be victims along the way. Near escapes, cliffhangers. In a horror story, it can't be certain that the hero will succeed or even survive. He almost has to die. This is a portrait of artistic accountability. Alan makes a wager when he dons the role of protagonist. Bodily risk for a better chance at success, balanced by an appeal to high drama all the hallmarks of a thriller. Alan is remediating his novel through the fast-paced attributes of film, television, and video games, where action and input are paramount. In essence, the text he produces in the cabin is not departure, but the game Alan Wake itself. But to confront the final televised self, the mad, mediated man bent on self-pity and self-destruction that we find in the game's final act, Alan and the player must achieve their highest degree of agency yet. In the abyssal fecundity of the dark place, game mechanics are transformed, or more accurately, their artifice is laid bare, revealing what they always were. It's not the light itself, but what it represents. You will need it. This is not a gun. It is a tool in a logical process of elimination. What is a gun in any video game other than a tool in a logical process of elimination? The violent removal of obstacles is so ubiquitous to the medium of digital games because it is fundamentally an operation of simplifying the world through the reduction of information. It is a process of making the world ever clearer, ever more legible. The light and the gun, 
illumination and elimination. It is deliberate that these tools are dispensed by way of a gestalt mirror television. Their remediation through the screen endows them with renewed efficacy. In the dark place, Alan's flashlight becomes a writing implement. Shining the beam on a floating word causes it to materialize with the satisfying click-clack of a typewriter. Up till this point, we've played a story that unfolded around us. Now, finally, the player claims some authorship. The words let us traverse impossible gaps, overcome desperate odds, and orchestrate action set pieces. Writing is a weapon, and a potent one. Kittler notes that Remington, the gun manufacturer, began producing typewriters in 1874 simply because, after the Civil War boom, things had been on the slow side. In his words, the typewriter became a discursive machine gun. These moments of triumphant carnage are rivaled only by the rock concert battle held at the farm of two washed-up musicians who were once enthralled by the same creative power that Alan must now face. Bolter and Grusin comment that rock music offers pure experience, pure authenticity. It is real in a sense that the listener's perception cannot be deceived. Perhaps this is why it is a song, The Poet and the Muse, which finally offers the clarity Alan needs to pursue his goals. Writing can be obscure, images can be fabricated, but it is impossible for music to be false. Although we later experience how it can be distorted in the dark place, an unsettling impediment rather than rousing encouragement. In the dark place, we first see Alan's self-destructive impulses manifest as a talking head on TV, then later as a body with a talking TV for a head. In your self-serving delusions, your personal problems are assets that allow you to save Alice, perhaps even the world. Here, the doctor is performing the role of a player theorizing about the game. He concocts a plausible explanation for the game's events as if it were a piece of media to deconstruct. Earlier, Alan also foregrounds the supernatural conceit of the game. For me, the supernatural had always been nothing but a metaphor for the human psyche, a tool to use in writing fiction. Now, it was happening for real. In these moments, Alan Wake is at its most hypermediated. It renders the characters and situations as more believable by having them comment upon their own existence as agents in a plot. He gasped. Mr. Wake, it happened just the way it was on that page. Mr. Wake? It happened just the way it was on that page. This is a world possessed, not only with reference to Poltergeist, but also to characters possessed by the inexorable fate of narrativity. There is a frantic horror in seeing the marionette strings a moment too late. The only way you're leaving this place is over my dead... Wait a minute. I know. Stories spiral in on themselves in recursive madness, toying with their victims before consuming them. And for those already taken, the spiral is one of mundanity. They repeat their vocational scripts, turning what was once innocuous in daylight into something vile and cruel, bereft of all context and sense. Premium cabins for rent in non-reservation deposit required. This darkness has desires. It wants something from Alan, something from us. It pools and seethes and recoils like a living thing. It is the void of art, the pure medium in itself. It is marble, pigment, celluloid, cathode ray tube, ink, and code. Alan Wake is about navigating the world as both an artist and a subject, of knowing when to follow convention and when to subvert it. It's about recognizing that our perception comes to us always already mediated by the fictive nature of our world, and striving to create something novel in spite of that. It's about being able to see darkness in two different lights, as evil, but also as primordial, infused with the latent power of creation. In this scene, 
Copies of Alan's last bestseller converge on him in a frenzy, backed by the taunts of his unraveling psyche. Wake's own words, littering the landscape. His books common and discarded, like mud beneath his feet. Hardbacks, paperbacks, turned against him. Trash. Just cheap trash. The fear of being called a hack, coupled with the hubris of genius. Immediately after, Alan must traverse a literary minefield where a flash of light, or inspiration, cast in the wrong direction could bear mortal consequences. The world is written around us. Being born, we are already haunted by cultural specters, the scope of whose influence would be impossible to delineate. And yet we persevere and create anew. Alan Wake revels in Kittler's final wisdom. Without ceasing to be written, we yet understand ourselves as writing subjects. That is how we outruse the ruse of world history, namely by writing it while it writes us. It's not a lake. It's an ocean. Thanks so much for watching and listening to me talk about one of my all-time favorite games. If you enjoy these kinds of videos, deep dives into media and philosophy and how they intersect, then I hope you'll consider subscribing to the channel for more and leaving a like and a comment below. See you next time.